great morning. Assumptions can be funny or dangerous. In the early 1800s, Dr. Dionysius Lardner warned that anyone traveling at full speed on the new rail cars would asphyxiate from lack of oxygen. Of course, today, high-speed trains go hundreds of kilometers an hour, and no one has died from asphyxiation yet. A harmful assumption made in the 17th century presumed that all blood is the same. Based on this incorrect assumption, a number of people died when their doctors transfused animal blood into their veins. Assumptions use known facts or accepted as true ideas to extrapolate beliefs that are actually unproven. The problem arises when an incorrect assumption is accepted as fact, and the more widespread the assumption, the stronger its power to delude. Today, Christendom is caught in a delusion. This delusion is based on a false assumption. Unfortunately, the assumption has the weight of nearly 1,600 years supporting it. Masses of people have accepted this assumption as truth for no other reason than its age. The assumption is that the modern week, Sunday through Saturday, has cycled continuously and without interruption since creation. This assumption has created the delusion that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath of Scripture, while Sunday, as the first day of the week, is the day on which Yahushua arose from the grave. The delusion is the result of the assumption, but the assumption is wrong. The truth is, today's Saturday is not the original Sabbath on which Yahweh rested at creation. Neither is Sunday the day on which Yahushua arose from the dead. Such statements sound shocking, but can actually be proven to be true. History, scripture, and even astronomy all confirm our modern week has not cycled continuously since creation. Many people, when first told that a continuous weekly cycle is nothing more than a myth, will point to Friday, October the 15th as proof that the week has indeed always cycled continuously and without interruption. The calendar transition from Julian to Gregorian was smooth and did not interrupt the weekly cycle. Only a few calendar dates or numbers were omitted. No days of the week were actually lost. Thursday, October the 4th was immediately followed by Friday, October the 15th in 1582. However, presuming that the week has never been interrupted, simply because it wasn't interrupted when the Julian calendar transitioned to the Gregorian, is a wrong assumption. It is easily disproven by history and archaeology. All ancient calendars were linked in some way to the moon. Strictly lunar calendars were shorter than the solar year, so months floated through the seasons. Luni solar calendars used the sun for years and the moon for months and weeks. Time itself is, of course, continuous. However, that does not mean that the method by which it is counted has always been continuous as well. In ancient times, the weekly cycle restarted with each new moon. The week in use today is called the planetary week. This is because the days of the week are named after various planets, or more precisely, planetary gods. This may surprise some, because once in power, the Roman Catholic Church wanted to hide the pagan origins of the planetary week and delude people into believing that it was but an extension of the biblical week. In this attempt, the Catholic Church was only partially successful. In a number of languages today, the original Saturday, or Saturn's day, 
was replaced by the word Sabbath, while the original Sunday, or Day of the Sun, is referred to as the Lord's Day. The purpose for changing the names of the days of the week was to deceive and hide the true biblical Sabbath. Eviatar Zerubbabel, an Israeli professor of sociology at Rutgers University, documents the pagan origins of the modern week as well as the Roman Catholic attempt to cover up those origins. In his meticulously documented book, The Seven Day Circle, The History and Meaning of the Week, Zerubbabel establishes that the length of the modern week was a deliberate choice, not an automatic extension of the biblical week. The church, backed by the power of the emperor, deliberately chose to use a week of seven days in order to emulate the Jewish seven-day week. He says, this should not be taken too lightly, as it could have chosen to assemble regularly in accordance with the traditional Roman eight-day weekly cycle. Zerubbabel is clear, however, that this does not make the modern week a Jewish construct. Rather, it was the convergence of both Jewish and astrological weeks around the time Christianity was being introduced into the Roman Empire that produced the seven-day cycle that has since spread throughout most of the civilized world. When people are presented with these facts of history, many point to the demonstrable fact that plenty of languages refer to the seventh day of the week as Sabbath, rather than using the original planetary designation of Saturn's day. Zerubbabel explains this as well. He documents the attempt made by the Roman Catholic Church to change the pagan names of the week to the biblical numerical names. In other words, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, preparation and Sabbath. The Roman Catholic attempt to replace the pagan names of the days of the week was not entirely successful. Even those languages that have derived from Latin use the pagan names for most of the days of the week. The Roman Catholic Church's efforts to suppress the pagan origins of the week, though only partially successful, is the reason why there are many languages today that have replaced the old Saturday with Sabbath and the original Sunday with the Lord's Day. Zerubbabel summarizes by stating, Thus, by the early 4th century, when the church finally gained control over the empire, it was evidently too late for any serious ecclesiastical effort to fully eliminate the astrological associations of the seven days of the week. By contrast, Zerubbabel says the Orthodox Church was successful in suppressing the astrological origins of the modern week. There are only five European languages that still use the original planetary names for all seven days of the week. All five are spoken in areas where there was little to no Christian influence during the time the use of the planetary week was spreading throughout Europe. The astrological influence is obviously even more pronounced around the fringes of the Roman Empire, where Christianity arrived only much later. Robert Leo Odom was another scholar that understood the pagan origins of the modern week, stating, The dictionaries, encyclopedias, and other general sources of information are practically unanimous in attributing the calendar names of the days to a pagan source. The modern week may be the same length as the biblical week, but that is where the similarity ends. When the planetary week first incorporated into the Julian calendar, the new seven-day week began on Saturday. This historical fact can be seen in this stick calendar found in the Baths of Titus, which were constructed in Rome in AD 81. Across the top, are the seven planetary gods in order of the days of the week. The very first god shown is Saturn. He is holding a sickle because he was considered god of the harvest. The next god in line on the second day of the week is Sol, or the sun god, crowned with rays of light. The third day has the moon goddess Luna, crowned by the crescent moon. The other gods follow in order. Mars, god of war, wearing a helmet. Mercury, wearing his winged helmet and holding a caduceus. Jupiter, clutching his customary bundle of thunderbolts. And finally, the last day of the week has the goddess of love, Venus. 
Only later was the week standardized to begin on Sunday and end on Saturday. The pagan planetary week, like the Julian calendar that adopted it, are irreparably pagan. The Julian calendar was a fairly recent invention when the Saviour walked the earth. At that time, the week was eight days long. Early Julian calendars were not constructed in grids as our modern calendars, but the dates were listed in columns, with the days of the week designated by the letters A through H. This is a fact easily established by history and archaeology. All early Julian calendars still in existence date between 32 BCE and 37 CE. They all show an eight-day week. The eight-day week of the Julian calendar was in use by the Romans during the life of Yehoshua. It is what the Roman legions stationed in Palestine were using, which raises an interesting point. There were two calendars readily known to the Jews in Yehoshua's day. The solar calendar of their Roman conquerors with its continuous eight-day weekly cycle, or the lunisolar calendar of creation, re-established at the Exodus with its seven-day week that restarted each new moon day. Which calendar do you think the Israelites would have used? The Julian calendar was both pagan and solar. The Gregorian calendar in use today is likewise both pagan and solar. It is almost identical to the pagan solar Julian calendar and has virtually no resemblance to the biblical lunisolar calendar of Yahweh. Inscriptions carved by Christians onto sepulchres provide additional archaeological evidence that the earliest Christians had knowledge of both the Julian calendar and the biblical calendar and the difference in the two calendars weekly cycles. One of the earliest found in Rome dates from 269 CE. It says in the consulship of Claudius and Paternus on the nones of November, on the day of Venus, and on the 24th day of the lunar month, Luces placed this memorial to her very dear daughter Severa and to thy Holy Spirit. She died at the age of 55 years and 11 months and 10 days. Notice it gives two different dates. The nones of November refers to November 5th. That year, this fell on the day of Venus, or Friday. In that particular lunation, this corresponded to the 24th day of the lunar month, which would have been second day on the biblical week. This is significant because if second day in that lunation fell on Friday, the seventh day and the Sabbath coincided with the pagan Wednesday or day of Mercury. Many people claim that Saturday is the biblical Sabbath simply because that is when the Jews worship. However, Jewish scholars are well aware that Saturday is not the original Sabbath of Scripture and admit this in their publications. The new moon is still, and the Sabbath originally was, dependent upon the lunar cycle. Originally, the new moon was celebrated in the same way as the Sabbath. With the development of the importance of the Sabbath as a day of consecration and the emphasis laid upon the significant number seven, the week became more and more divorced from its lunar connection. The months of the year were lunar and began with the new moon. Ultimately, the Jews set aside the ancient calendar of creation due to the extreme persecution that fell on anyone clinging to the biblical calendar following the Council of Nicaea. Under the reign of Constantius, 337 to 362, the persecutions of the Jews reached such a height that the computation of the calendar was forbidden under pain of severe punishment. Declaring the new month by observation of the new moon and the new year by the arrival of spring can only be done by the Sanhedrin. In the time of Hillel II, the last president of the Sanhedrin, the Romans prohibited this practice. Hillel II was therefore forced to institute his fixed calendar. The Council of Nicaea was the turning point. As the chronologist David Sidersky explained, it was no more possible under Constance to apply the old calendar. As a result of this intense persecution, 
Hillel II, the last president of the Sanhedrin, modified the ancient Hebrew calendar. No longer would the weekly cycle be based on observation of the moon. The Jews afterward worshipped on Saturday, the seventh day of the newly standardized Julian week. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated, and by a complicated but skillful adjustment of the calendar, it was found no difficult matter in general to get paganism and Christianity, now far sunk in idolatry, to shake hands. The true biblical calendar was set aside in favor of the pagan Julian calendar. This was done for no other reason than to gain political power. Catholic scholars know this. The American Catholic Quarterly Review admitted the Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. The Ecclesiastical Review stated they, the Protestants, deem it their duty to keep the Sunday holy. Why? Because the Catholic Church tells them to do so. They have no other reason the observance of Sunday thus comes to be an ecclesiastical law entirely distinct from the divine law of Sabbath observance. The author of the Sunday law is the Catholic Church. This is significant because if Saturday is not the biblical Sabbath, then Sunday is not the day of Yahushua's resurrection. Sunday did not exist on the eight-day week of the early Julian calendar. Therefore, the Savior could not have risen on that day. Sunday has no basis for worship since it is a tradition of the Roman Catholic Church just as they have always claimed. Patrick Madrid is an American Roman Catholic author, apologist and radio host. On January 5, 2006, Madrid was on EWTN, Global Catholic Radio Network, on Open Line, a call-in radio show, a listener called in with a question regarding the change of worship day. Madrid's response, while giving a Catholic spin to justify no longer worshipping on the biblical Sabbath, reveals he is well aware of the facts of history and scripture. He stated, What your brother-in-law may not understand is that the Catholic Church did not change that Sabbath commandment. The Catholic Church observes the commandment to keep holy the Sabbath, but it does so on the Lord's Day, and the earliest Christians transferred their observance of that commandment from Saturday to Sunday. First of all, because there was a distinct break between the Old Testament requirements, the rituals and the Mosaic Covenant demands dealing with the Sabbath worship and animal sacrifices and that sort of thing and they wanted to show that Christianity was distinct from Judaism. It came from Judaism, but it was distinct from it. Celebrating the Lord's resurrection and death on the day that he rose from the dead seemed to be the most appropriate. The other thing that we should remember too is that our calendar that we follow, including Seventh-day Adventists, is not only a calendar that was devised by the Catholic Church, but also it is a calendar that's based upon the solar year, not the lunar year. And the Jewish calendar that was observed in the time of Christ follows a lunar calendar, which is several days short of the solar calendar. So, the great irony is that even the Seventh-day Adventists themselves are not worshipping on exactly the same Sabbath day as the Jews of the time of Christ, because it's several days off now, having switched from following the lunar calendar. The facts of history establish that Saturday is not the Bible Sabbath, and Yahushua did not rise from the grave on Sunday. Satan has substituted counterfeit worship days in his efforts to exalt an entire system of false worship. Pagan papal sun worship versus pure biblical worship of the Almighty. There is no one text in scripture that explains how the biblical calendar worked for one very simple reason. It was assumed knowledge since everyone used that calendar. However, clues exist and are liberally scattered throughout the Bible. When scripture is compared with scripture and contrasted with the modern calendar, the differences become very apparent. Scripture repeatedly refers to something that simply does not exist in the modern calendar, new moons. 
Clearly, a different way of calculating time was used. The difference in calendation is first encountered during creation week. Then Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. And it was so. The word translated seasons comes from the Hebrew word moed, which means a fixed time or season, specifically a festival. It is used throughout Leviticus 23, referring to the feasts of Yahweh. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. The very first feast listed was the weekly feast of the seventh day Sabbath. Then the others given were the annual feasts. Since the Jewish festivals occurred at regular intervals, this word becomes closely identified with them. Moed is used in a broad sense for all religious assemblies. It is a common term for the worshipping assembly of Yah's people. Time is measured by movement. The purpose of tracking the moon's movement was to establish holy days. This is clearly spelled out in Psalms. He appointed the moon for seasons. Here again, the word translated seasons is moed, or the worshipping assemblies of Yah's people. New moon days are the most important days, function-wise, of the entire biblical calendar. They regulate the beginning of the months as well as the beginning of the weekly cycle. The month was a unit of time closely tied to the moon. The Hebrew word for month also meant moon. The reason for the connection between the month and the moon is that the beginning of a month was marked by a new moon. The moon was carefully observed by the people of Bible times. Where the Julian and Gregorian calendars both have a continuous weekly cycle, the biblical calendar does not. The weekly cycle restarts every new moon. The week of seven days was connected with the lunar month, of which it is approximately a fourth. The emphasis laid on the requirement that the weeks of Pentecost should be complete suggests that weeks might be reckoned in such a way as to violate this injunction. Because the weekly cycle restarted every new moon, the Sabbath always fell on the same dates for each and every lunar month. New Moon Day was in a class all by itself, but it was a worship day. Thus, the second of each month was also the first day of every work week. Every place in the Bible where Sabbaths and New Moons are indicated, the second day of the moon or month is always the first work day, and the 8th, 15th, 22nd and 29th days of the month are Sabbaths without exception. Additionally, every single time a date for the seventh-day Sabbath can be extrapolated from surrounding texts, it also falls on these same dates. This would be impossible with a continuous weekly cycle. Interestingly enough, the people who have the hardest time accepting the fact that Saturday is not the true Sabbath are those who worship on Saturday. They protest... God would never have allowed the Sabbath to be forgotten. It's impossible. Therefore, Saturday must be the Sabbath. Such an argument is a logical fallacy. Not only can Saturday be proven to not be the true Sabbath, but in Scripture, Yahweh himself declares that the Sabbath will be forgotten and that he will be the one who ensures that it is forgotten. The prophet Jeremiah was lamenting the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. Babylon is also a symbol for the entire infrastructure of false worship, so Jeremiah's lament has a secondary application pointing forward to a time when knowledge of the true Sabbath was lost. Yahweh was as an enemy, he hath swallowed up Israel, he hath destroyed his places of the assembly. Yahweh hath caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. Hosea also declares that the punishment for spiritual adultery is for the gift of the Sabbath to be taken away. 
I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. It was by compromise with paganism that the early Christian church lost its apostolic purity. This opened the floodgates to all of the deceptions of Satan. By not valuing and preserving the truth, the people of Yah lost it. When the truth of heaven is not cherished as it should be, Yah removes it. He causes it to be forgotten. And that is precisely what happened. The adoption of the pagan week by ecclesiastical authorities uniting their power with secular authorities in the 4th century led to the persecution of all who wished to cling to biblical calendation. As Roman Catholicism exalted pagan sun worship, apostolic Christianity was obliterated. As Robert Odom observed, it seems as if some spiritual genius having control over the pagan world had so ordered things that the heathen planetary week should be introduced just at the right time for the most popular sun cult of all ages to come along and exalt the day of the sun as a day above and more sacred than all the rest. Surely this was not accidental. This slow metamorphosis from pure apostolic Christianity to a Christianity intertwined with pagan calendation principles is largely responsible for the lack of knowledge existing today regarding the true calendar of the Creator. The pagan continuous weekly cycle reaches so far back in history it is assumed that a continuous weekly cycle has always existed. The historical facts of the Julian calendar have been forgotten and circular reasoning has been used to prove that Saturday is the biblical Sabbath. The Sabbath is important. It makes no sense whatsoever that the Creator would not have established a method of time calculation whereby anyone, anywhere, and at any time could know when the Sabbath comes. Yahweh, remember, is the Creator of all. He didn't need to give Adam and Eve a calendar printed on a piece of paper. He embedded his timekeeping system into the very fabric of creation and installed it in the skies for all to see, regardless of where they were on earth. It likewise defies all logic for Yahweh to entrust the calculation of the Sabbath to his enemy, Lucifer, or to the Pope himself. The modern Gregorian solar calendar is a papal invention. It is even named after Pope Gregory XIII. When it was first introduced, only three countries accepted it, and those were all Catholic countries. The other countries rejected it for being Catholic. And yet, the Julian calendar the other countries clung to was no better, as it was a pagan calendar. Only the loony solar calendar of creation has the ability to pinpoint Yah's true Moedim, heaven's appointed times for worship. Truth has been so scattered and buried under centuries of error and assumption, it requires patience and painstaking attention to detail to assemble the various missing puzzle pieces of truth. However, recorded in the starry heavens is more evidence that helps to establish beyond a doubt that Saturday is not the Bible Sabbath. These are the date of the crucifixion and the international dateline. Scholars from Sir Isaac Newton to astronomer Karl Schoch have attempted to establish the date of the crucifixion. Repeatedly, the mistake they have made is trying to use a proleptic calendar. A proleptic calendar is simply a calendar that extends its dating system backward to time before its actual introduction. Extending the Gregorian calendar backward to dates preceding its official introduction in 1582 produces the proleptic Gregorian calendar. This can be done with any calendar. There are certain limitations to proleptic calendars, however, and nowhere is this more clearly seen than in the various attempts to establish the crucifixion date. Believers today have tried to count backward to the time of Yahushua to prove that he was crucified on a Friday. Others have done the same, attempting to prove he was actually crucified on a Wednesday. However, both are impossible for no other reason than the fact that neither Friday nor Wednesday had yet been introduced into the Julian calendar. The Julian calendar at that time still used a week of eight days. Therefore, any claims that the Saviour sacrificed his life on a Friday or a Wednesday is based on proleptic dates, nothing more. 
It is true, however, that Yahushua was crucified on the sixth day of the week, the Passover. Leviticus 23 gives the date for the Passover. In the 14th day of the first month, at even, is Yahweh's Passover. On the lunisolar calendar, the 14th day of every month always falls on the sixth day of the week. So, without a doubt, Yahushua died on the day before the seventh day Sabbath. This is confirmed by the Gospel of John. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The day following the Passover is not only the seventh day Sabbath, it is also the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahweh. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In other words, a high Sabbath. The prophecies of Daniel, when understood correctly, pinpoint 31 AD as the actual year of the crucifixion. Many scholars have rejected 31 AD as the crucifixion year because they were looking for a year when the 14th day of the lunar month, the Passover on Abib 14, coincided with a proleptic Friday. Calculations from the Astronomical Applications Department of the United States Naval Observatory proves that the 14th day of the lunar month could not have coincided with a proleptic Friday in 31 AD. These are astronomical facts, preserved in the heavens, easily calculated because they are so predictable. But there's more. The international dateline is one of the most obvious and most amusing proofs that the modern calendar cannot be used to establish the biblical Sabbath. It is a man-made invention, established by a group of men in 1884. It is purely arbitrary, and it has changed a number of times for no other reason than convenience. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States Department of Commerce admits to the purely arbitrary nature of the International Dateline, stating, Despite its name, the International Dateline has no legal international status and countries are free to choose the dates that they observe. While the Dateline generally runs north to south from pole to pole, it zigzags around political borders such as eastern Russia and Alaska's Aleutian Islands. A quick glance at a map of the International Dateline shows how arbitrary it is. The frequent changes in the International Dateline have created problems for Saturday Sabbath keeping Christians in Samar. Were they to worship on the new Seventh-day Sabbath? Or did they cling to the old, which meant that, with the new date, they were now worshipping on Sunday? The International Dateline is imaginary and completely arbitrary. It is laughable to assume that Yahweh would allow something as important as his Sabbath to be dependent on something so changeable as the modern calendar, which, with a simple vote, can be changed. The man-made International Dateline is necessary only if you are going to calculate the Sabbath by the Papal Gregorian calendar. However, if you use the Moon to establish the beginning of months, and thus the Sabbath, such an artificial device isn't necessary. The moon is accurate regardless of where one lives. Pseudo-religion is like pseudo-science. It's fake, a fraud masquerading as the truth. In pseudo-science as well as pseudo-religion, an hypothesis is based on an assumption and then efforts are expended to prove the hypothesis rather than to arrive at the truth. However, if the assumption is incorrect, no amount of proof will transform error into truth. Likewise, a long tradition of calling Saturday the Sabbath does not make it so. The fact that modern Jews now worship on Saturday proves nothing more than what their scholars have already admitted. They no longer worship by the biblical calendar. Archaeology, scripture and astronomy demonstrate the truth. The original Sabbath of the Bible was calculated by the lunisolar calendar based on the movements of the moon. Thus, Saturday is not the true Sabbath, and Sunday is not the day of Yahushua's resurrection. Both are counterfeit days of worship, established by Satan in order to usurp the worship due Yahweh alone. 
Abraham Lincoln once observed, when a man who is honestly mistaken hears the truth, he will either quit being mistaken or cease being honest. The decision now is yours. With the facts spread before you, what will you decide? Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it is right.